Did you know that one of the world's largest and fastest growing luxury brands, Gucci, would not have seen the light of day if a hitman was not hired to do the unthinkable? Gucci was built on the hard work of its founder, Guccio Gucci. He trusted his legacy to thrive in the hands of his sons, but would not have imagined that a bitter and incompetent grandson would set out to ruin everything. In this video, we'll talk about everything Gucci. How did Gucci rise from humble beginnings to eventually survive two world wars and family feuds? Guccio Gucci was born in Florence, Italy on the 26th of March, 1881. He started from very humble beginnings, as his parents were just merchants of straw hats and leather goods. Although Guccio's parents groomed him to take over the business, he wanted to achieve more for himself. By the time he was 17, he'd left home and moved to London in 1899. He was employed at the Savoy, one of the most luxurious hotels in London, as a dishwasher, waiter, and bellhop. Unbeknownst to most, the Savoy was one of the first hotels to have an electric elevator. As soon as it was introduced, Guccio was given the opportunity to be an elevator assistant. This rare opportunity gave Guccio access to the wealthy and famous guests. Being so close, he was able to observe them. Aside from their style preferences, he quickly noticed that they traveled with elegant handbags and luggage. These pieces were not just functional, but also symbols of status. They were made of the finest qualities and, as such, would be expensive to acquire. It was during this time that he understood that hard work without targeting the right clients would not bring success. He worked at the Savoy for a few more years. Once he'd saved enough money, he returned to Florence. He met and got married to Adia Cavelli. By 1914, the First World War broke out and Guccio had to leave his family again and serve in the army. After surviving the four-year war, he returned home but was faced with an already struggling economy. He had a wife and six children and would have to provide for them regardless of the economic devastation. Guccio then accepted a job with a leather goods producing company. He was very willing to learn and work closely with the owner. By doing this, he learned the basics of the trade and how to work with the different kinds of leather. He was a quick study, and in no time, he was offered a managerial position for a new branch that opened in Rome. It was a good opportunity, but Ada refused to leave Florence. Unable to move with his family, Guccio had no other choice than to shuttle back and forth. While doing this, he never forgot his plans to open up his own store in Florence. During a weekend trip home in 1921, he went for a stroll with Ada. While walking past a narrow Florentine street, they spotted a small empty shop. Supportive of her husband's dream, Ada encouraged Guccio to take advantage of the opportunity and finally open his store. He gathered all their savings and had to take a loan from an acquaintance in order to do this. The store was initially called Valigeria Guccio Gucci before it was eventually shortened to Gucci. He sold saddles and other leather accessories to horsemen. As a remnant of his time in London, he also handpicked handbags and luggage from suppliers in Tuscany, England, and Germany. He would then display and sell them in his store. He had a very keen sense of what rich tourists were going to buy, and this helped the business significantly. In no time, he resolved not to depend on suppliers. He opened a new workshop that would allow him to create and repair his own products. Guccio's products were always well-received and loved, so it was not far-fetched to think that the store was successful. However, this was not the case. Guccio kept the awful secret of the store's finances from his staff and even his family. For years, Guccio would try to turn a profit, but to no avail. Suppliers who had initially let him buy goods on credit were demanding payment, whereas most of his local clients were not redeeming their debts. When he couldn't hide the situation anymore, he finally gathered his family and most valued staff to tell them he was about to declare bankruptcy. It might not have been what he was expecting, but they didn't let him give up. The store was doing well in attracting people. The only problem was that it had a lot of debts. As such, he was advised to take another loan that would take care of those debts so that he could be free to take the business to the next level. They were right. Within a few months, he was able to settle his debts and repay the loan. He also hired very skilled artisans to improve the quality of their products. The business became profitable, but this feat would soon be short-lived. The leadership in Italy went through some changes that would affect businesses. 
Like many other leather craftsmen in Italy at the time, Guccio could no longer afford to access leather. Refusing to fail a second time, Guccio would turn to other readily available materials with which he could work. He began to use canvas to produce handbags and luggage. He would also creatively add leather to some parts of the products, such as the corners, straps, and flaps, to give them a unique design. The designs were so popular that Guccio knew he could expand and produce other accessories. He introduced belts, wallets, and shoes. By 1935, one of Guccio's sons, Aldo, had already begun to think bigger. He'd taken a trip around Europe and realized that many people were interested in Gucci products. He brought his expansion ideas to his father, but he was shut down. Guccio believed the plans were too risky and required too much money to execute. Having a lot of confidence in his plans, Aldo went behind his father's back and applied for a bank loan. Eventually, Guccio came around. With Guccio's support and Aldo's daring ideas, the second Gucci store was opened in Rome in 1938. This move would prove to be a good one by the advent of the Second World War in 1939. Rome was an open city during the war, and soldiers always trooped in for different reasons. In time, the Gucci store would become the best place to get quality accessories they could send home to their wives or mothers. Though there was a shortage of supplies and production materials, the Gucci team continued to make unique products with what they had access to. This birthed some signature Gucci designs, such as the bamboo handle on handbags. In 1951, Guccio opened a third store in Milan, but died a few years later in 1953. Aldo, Rodolfo, and Vasco, who were already active in the family business, took over after their father's death. Two weeks before Guccio died, his sons opened Gucci's first American store in New York after collecting a $6,000 loan from a bank. Gucci was the first Italian exclusive label to open a store in the city. The store had so much buzz that it began to attract royals and celebrities from all over the world. Queen Elizabeth II, Princess Grace of Monaco, Sophia Loren, Jackie Kennedy, Elizabeth Taylor, and Catherine Hepburn, just to mention a few, were huge fans of the label. Aldo continued to expand the business abroad. Rodolfo chose to manage the store in Milan, while Vasco was left to run the factory in Florence. Together, they did an outstanding job running the business. Within a few years, they opened dozens of stores all over the world. Just like other luxury brands, the House of Gucci also ventured into clothes, watches, and perfumes. Despite the success, it should also be known that during the years that followed after Guccio's death, there would be a series of family feuds that would almost ruin the business. To begin with, Guccio didn't leave any shares to his daughter Grimalda. She contested her father's will in court, but her plea was denied, and she left empty-handed. Similarly, in 1983, when Vasco died and his shares were left to Maria, his widow, the brothers wasted no time in buying her out. They didn't give their sister a seat at the table, so they certainly weren't going to let Maria in. In a bid to prevent further disputes, Aldo declared that his sons Giorgio, Paolo, and Roberto would get equal parts of his shares upon his death. He even went ahead to share 10% among them so they could join the business early enough. Rodolfo had a son, Maurizio but he wouldn't give him anything. When Rodolfo passed away in 1918, Maurizio inherited all his shares. Being the largest shareholder, he made too many bad decisions that almost ran the company into the ground. The House of Gucci was said to have lost about $30 million each year after he assumed total leadership in 1989 after buying out the rest of the family. The glory days for Gucci would only finally return after Maurizio died in 1995. And the most surprising plot twist in this story is that his ex-wife, Patrizia Reggiani, had hired a hitman to murder him. And this move saved the family business from further ruin. Investcor later on would assume Gucci's leadership and hire Tom Ford as the creative director for the label. From then on, Gucci would expand so much that it generated a billion dollars each year. Two successful IPOs later, the house of Gucci is now worth over $17 billion.